we're starting a brand new series called Foolproof. Foolproof. And uh, just thought it'd be really cool to unpack what that word actually means. Do you know foolproof kids and big kids is something that is reliable, something that we can depend on, something that is sure, that's tried and proven not to fail, something that is perfect, flawless, and true. And God's words in the Bible are foolproof. They're reliable, they're true, they can be trusted. Why? Well, because he inspired lots of different people over thousands of years to write down what he was showing them, what he was telling them, And all together, all the stories in the Bible actually point to this big, grand story about what really matters and what's most important in life. And it's not a made-up story. It's how God has chosen to tell us what he's like, what his plans are, what he's done for us, So we can know him as our heavenly father and friend. Do you know the Bible is such a smart, foolproof book? It's such a smart, foolproof book. Because God's words are totally reliable, perfect and true. They are his promises and his manual for living. Has Anyone here ever tried to help their parents put together something from Ikea? You get a manual, you get some instructions, but they're not really, really helpful. (laughs) But when we want to know how something works, a toy, putting together an Ikea cupboard or a swing set, we read the instructions. Well, look at the pictures in Ikea's case. (laughs) The designer who made the toy or the cupboard or the swing set shows us step by step, sometimes with lots of steps, how to put it together and how to make it work as it was created to work. And the Bible teaches us that God is our master designer. I want you to have a look at the screen because it's got a Bible promise on there that's true about each one of us. It says, you created the deepest parts of my being. You put me together inside my mother's body. How you made me is amazing and wonderful. I praise you for that. What you have done is wonderful I know that very well. None of my bones were hidden from you when you made me inside my mother's body. That place was as dark as the deepest parts of the earth. When you were putting me together there, your eyes saw my body even before it was formed. You planned how many days I would live. You wrote down the number of them in your book before I had lived through even one of them. That's amazing. Do you know God created you and I to know him and love him and enjoy him forever. He even thinks about you. Did you know that? Not just kids, grown-up kids. He even thinks about you. Have a listen to this verse. It says, God, your thoughts about me are priceless. No one can possibly add them all up. If I could count them, they would be more than the grains of sand. Do you think you could count sand on the beach? There's so much of it. When you look at it really close, there's so many like teeny tiny little grains. God thinks about you a lot. He inspired people over thousands of years to write down his instructions for how to make you and I work best. 
He wants us to know how we are meant to live as he created us to live. He knew if we try to come up with our own ideas of how we're meant to live, it won't work very well. And he knew if we tried to live our lives without him, it would be a big mess. Kids, sometimes when we hear what's happening in the world, we might hear about wars that are happening. We might see information about hungry people who go without food. We might see the ugly way people treat each other, the hurtful and wrong things that people do to others, even the selfish things that we think or do. When we see these things, we understand that God's right when he says that the world's in a big mess. We can see it and hear about it and it feels sometimes like we're right in the middle of it. Sometimes it even feels like there's a big mess inside of us. But the Bible is such a smart book because it also shows us how much God loves us and how much he wants to help. Before we were even born, he made a plan so we wouldn't have to be stuck in this mess of living life without him. Let's have a look at another verse. It says, God chose us, he chose you to belong to Christ before the world was created. He chose us to be holy and without blame in his eyes. Other people might look at you and think, that's not very cool. But in God's eyes, he doesn't blame us because of Jesus. He loved us. And so the Bible is such a smart book because it tells us how God loves us and how he proved that he loves us. Every story within the Bible points us to Jesus, God's son. And Jesus is always the focus of God's story because he's the one who came into the world on a big rescue mission. He's the one. God sent him and God sent him to show us what he's like and to teach us what is true. He is exactly like God. And when we see who Jesus is, when we see how he treated people, when we read the Bible in Matthew, Mark, Luke or John in the Gospels, when we read those stories and see how he treated people, we see God the Father. Best of all, Jesus' rescue mission involved him showing us just how far God was willing to go to buy us back so we could know God as our heavenly father. Just how far he was willing to go to get us out of the big mess that we're in, of trying to live life without him. (laughs) He was willing to die on a cross for all the times that we stuff up, that we think wrong and we do wrong. And do you know that's what sin is? You might have heard that word before, but sin is basically trying to live your life without God. Think you can run your own life. That's what sin is. And all of us are guilty of that. Wanting to be the boss of our own life. Without Jesus' rescue mission, our sin separated us from God forever. But Jesus did complete his rescue mission. You might have heard people singing or lifting their hands. It's a way of saying, I love you, God. I worship you this morning. It's because anyone here who's experienced what Jesus did for them and that he, he, he got them out of the big mess that they were in and he took their sin and he, he died for them and was buried, but he's now alive. Anyone who's experienced that is pretty excited about who Jesus is because they love him. The wonderful thing he has done means we don't have to be separated from God forever. He died in our place instead of us. And he did it to take away your sin, my sin, and the sin of the whole world. 
Jesus isn't dead anymore. Do you know that? He isn't dead anymore. He's alive. You might have felt something when you came into this place, felt his presence because he's real and he's here by the power of his Holy Spirit. We can't see him with our eyes, but we can sense him as we meet together. When you ask Jesus to come into your life and be your forever friend, you get to know God forever as your father. You get to spend forever in heaven with him. You're not separated from him anymore because he's taken away our sin and when he looks at us, he doesn't blame us. He sees us as holy without fault it's like a report card we see all the things where we should be getting an f but god's given us jesus perfect a plus that's how he sees us when you ask jesus to come in and take charge of your life sin can't block you from god anymore And death can't keep you away from him forever. You will one day physically die, but you're going to go, if you believe in him and put your life and invite him into your life, put your life in his hands, you will spend forever, forever, forever. That means endless, ongoing, forever with him. And so before we continue in the next part, it says, I just wanted to give an opportunity for any child, for any grown-up, to respond to God's love. He made the first move when we didn't want to know anything about him. He came because he doesn't want you to live apart from him forever. He wants you to love him and know him and enjoy him forever. So can we just bow our heads and close our eyes? We don't need a keyboard right now. If you hear some kids making noises, You can focus your thoughts just on God. The gospel, the good news about Jesus is so powerful that a young child can understand it. As well as a grown-up. Right now, if you've never, ever given your life to Jesus, if you've never said, Jesus... If you showed me that you love me that much, I actually want you to take charge of my life. Come into my life. I have been trying to live my life without you. and I don't want to do that anymore. You just ask him, say, Jesus, come into my life. Right now where you're seated, seated, seated. you just ask him. You say something like, I believe in you. Come into my life. Thank you for your forgiveness. Help me to follow you. I just believe the Holy Spirit is moving on the hearts of lots of people here today. Lord, I thank you for the truth of who you are. That you didn't want us to be stuck trying to sort out our own lives without you. You saw the big mess that we were in and you came. Died on a horrible cross to take away our sin. So that we can live with you forever and ever. And I thank you for the people here who have responded to you, have opened up their hearts to you. I just believe there's people here who have opened up their hearts and lives and welcomed you in. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help them to follow you and to know you and to walk with you for the rest of their days until they go to meet you face to face. In Jesus' name. I pray. Amen.
Amen. If you prayed that prayer, can I encourage you, that is the best thing you could ever do (laughs) with your life, is put it into Jesus' hands. If you prayed that prayer and you're a kid, can I encourage you to tell your par- your, your mum or your dad or your carer, someone that you came with? And if you pray that prayer and you're a grown-up, tell someone. Tell someone. Because God has started a work in your life. It's not just an emotional response. He's actually come up close and personal to you. And he wants to help you follow him. Cool. We don't have to wait to the end of the service to talk about Jesus and invite people to receive him. He's moving. (laughs) It's good. (laughs) All right. That was pretty quiet. I was very impressed. I think Jesus must have been helping a lot of people because there was not much movement going on. That's awesome. All right. Well, we, with this series on foolproof, we're talking about wisdom. And we thought it would be a really good idea to have our very own Little Big Shots. Now, has anyone seen Little Big Shots before? Put up your hand. Come on, this is interactive. Good. All right. Now, we're not going to get kids up to do a special act or to show us how good they are at something because they've got lots of talents, that's for sure. But we thought it would be really cool cool to get kids' thoughts on what wisdom is all about. So we're going to welcome up Henry Hunter and Chloe Masimwa and Lockie um, Adamson, And Pastor Sam's going to come and help me for our very own Little Big Shots. Put your hands together. All right. Okay, so you guys are preaching today. Is that all right? Yeah, come on. Perfect. We also need Nick to come up and help us because we've got a bit of a a game that we want to start you with just to help you to relax because we know that you've all put some thought into what you want to say. And everyone out here thinks you're pretty brave and awesome. Can we put our hands together for these kids? (laughs) Takes a lot of guts to come and sit up here. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to get Nick to hold up something which is a piece of advice that you could be given by someone and we want you to talk amongst yourselves and then tell us if this advice is wise or foolish all right the first one is it's okay to run with scissors what do you think wise wise (laughs) hang on i think you need to talk together who are your parents have another discussion (laughs) that's all right Have another chat before you answer, Henry. You don't have to answer straight away. Talk with Chloe and Lockie and get them to help you. Okay, five seconds. Quick, have a chat. What one do you think? Foolish. Very good. Let's put our hands together. Okay, let's reveal. Yes, very good. All right, let's have a look at the next one. Unveil. Never listen to your mum. Okay, wise or foolish? Foolish. (laughs) Foolish. Why is it foolish, Chloe? Foolish. Yeah, but why? Um, God tells you to obey your parents. Very good. Yes, and because mum's say, always right as I thought well. you were going to say because I'll get into trouble, but that's a better reason. That's right. Very good. All right. Next. It was foolish. They got it right. All right. The next one is you should not steal. Is that wise advice or foolish? Wise. Why is it wise? Um, because it's wrong to very true it is wrong to steal good 10 points for you guys well done all right well done nick just speed it up there with the answers please all right the kids are way ahead of you at this point just flum on the floor that's all right (laughs) put okay this put cheese in your ears this 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 is not an instruction hang on henry before you answer think about it is this wise or foolish foolish oh very good good Please don't try that at home, children. It's like a thing of what you're not to do, all right? Because you really won't be able to hear for quite a while. All right, this one is don't go to sleep angry at night time. Is that wise or foolish? That is wise. Oh, you had to pause and think. Why is that wise, Chloe? Um, pause the mic really close. Because going to sleep angry is not a good thing and... God always wants you to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. And I reckon they're both excellent answers. He says, don't let the sun go down 
while you're still angry. Sort it out and have a chat with someone if you need to. See, good we one. told you guys would do a little bit of preaching up the front here very today. This is, this is very good. All right, have we got any more here, Nick? What's our next one? Okay, oh, I like this one actually. Play for six, six hey. hours of games on an iPad every day. <laughs> I saw some children nodding. What's going a few, on? A few adults were nodding as well, Cass. Scary. Okay, Scary wise thought. or foolish? Um, I guess it depends on who you ask. <laughs> Very diplomatic, Lockie. Very diplomatic. That's right. There's educational would, games, isn't there, Lockie? I would well say done. It's, it's foolish because it's probably not very good for your eyes. Good. Yeah, foolish. All right, this one's a good one. Your turn, Sam. <laughs> Eat ice cream with mustard. <laughs> Wise or foolish? Foolish. Yes, definitely you foolish. You should try that today. Go home and try it and see if it's wise or foolish. You'll have right. a pleasant ah. surprise. Old English toffee, not old English <laughs> mustard. All, all right. right. Be kind to others, even to your brother. I know that all of you have got brothers, and sometimes it's hard to be kind to your brother. But is it wise or foolish to be kind to your brother? It's wise. Very true. And all the parents said? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Keep going. Right, la last one. No, there's two more. This one's your last one. Only eat lollies. Which kids think it's a good idea? It's Only eat. Oh, come on. Seriously. All right. Is that wise or foolish? Foolish. Why is it foolish? Um, because uh, you don't want to be fat, I guess. <laughs> yes. And possibly and your, your teeth parents might don't fall want out. you to be hyperactive either. No red lollies. Very good. And the last one is remember to flush the toilet. Is that wise <laughs> or foolish? Uh. Wise. Yes. <laughs> it is wise. The person coming after you doesn't really want to see your business. So well done. Thank you, Nick. Put your hands together. It's a good place to finish, I reckon, Pastor Cass. Yes, that was so good. All right, we're gonna, we've asked these kids to just prepare a little bit. So if they've got some notes, they can whip them out and that's okay. But um, I want to start with you, Lockie. Tell us someone who you know who is really wise and what makes them a wise person? Um, I pick two people. I pick my mum um, because she knows what to do in nearly every situation. And then I pick my brother, Zach. Zach's really helpful when I need tips. He doesn't brag. Um, and he know, and he, um, when he knows something, that, and he's got an amazing fashion sense. Come on, Zach. <laughs> Plug for the brother. Did he tell you to say Woo! that? Okay. Chloe, what about you? Who is someone you know who is really wise and what makes them a wise person? I picked my father because he knows what to do and takes care of responsibilities. He's obviously not perfect because nobody is perfect, but he, in my book, he's a perfect dad. Wow. Did you have to pay her to say that? Is she getting well extra pocket money? No, she's just sweet, beautiful girl. That's so lovely, Chloe. All right. Henry, what about you? Who is someone that you know who is wise and what makes them wise? My dad. Why is your dad wise? Um, because every time I ask him a question, he always answers with the right answer and I'm pretty sure that is. You're pretty sure that is? You don't have to Google it to check? No, and don't have Google and I don't have a phone. Oh, got it. That would be an important Great. factor. And Henry was very much looking forward to being a part of the discussion today. He and, is so uh, excited, it's good. You just never know what they're going to say, it's great. That's part of the excitement. Okay, I'd like to ask you a next question. I might pass that down the end to Lockie. Let's see, we're doing a wisdom series here at church. I'd love to hear from you all, very briefly, what you think wisdom is. I feel like wisdom um, um, is knowing the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, and then choosing the right decision in every situation. Awesome. Okay, pass that along. Chloe? That is impressive. Same question. I think wisdom is the knowledge of God. So if you pray, and then you can receive wisdom. I do think we've got a preacher there in the middle. Okay, Henry, what is wisdom? Uh, something that makes people wise. But, and I know why it makes people wise. It's, um, as Lockie said, it's the thing that makes people know the difference between good and evil. Very Perfect. smart. Okay, Chloe, this one's for you. How can kids learn how to make wise choices? They can pray to God and ask for wisdom. Yep. 
Awesome. What about you, Lockie? Same question. Um, I think, oh wait, sorry. I think kids can learn to make wise choices by talking to people like Zach, mum, or other wise people and taking note of what they say. That's that great. Really I know important. your parents would say that too when they asked, like, how, kids, how do you be wise? Listen to mum and dad. Good. That's what I'd say to my kids too. Which children are taking notes? I hope mine are. No, keep going. What do you think, Henry? What can kids do to be make wise choices? Ask their parents or anyone that you feel comfortable to talking to. Very good. Get some help. That's awesome. So good. We also thought it would be really great to hear what you guys think is really important for kids to understand. So we might actually start with you, Henry. What do you think is important for, really important for kids to understand? Um, to remember to always pray to God. Yep, I reckon that's a really good answer. What about you, Chloe? I think it's really important that kids know how to pray and ask for wisdom when they need it. I think it's important for kids to understand that old people, like my mum, aren't always talking... No yeah, offense, yeah, yeah. She's not very old. Don't be like that. Aren't always talking nonsense. They actually have important lessons to share. <laughs> Some veiled encouragement for mum. Very true. Was that the end of your answer? Is you just getting an early applause? Okay, good. Um, I'm going to go back to Chloe and ask you the next one. What is something you think is really important for grown-ups to understand? Because sometimes grown-ups do a lot of talking to kids about what they should know. So we thought it would be good for you guys to tell us what you think would be really important for grown-ups to understand. I think it's really important that grown-ups understand children's emotions for like when they're angry they should understand why they're angry or if they're sad they should understand why they're sad and I think that's a very important par thing that parents need to learn. Yeah so can they ask questions and say are you feeling sad would that be helpful? Yeah, yeah cool pretty wise. All right Henry what about for you what is something something that you think is really important for a grown-up to understand? For them to understand that that uh, da. Um, it's all right. We can we we can let you have thinking time. Uh, Do you want us to come back? Yeah. All right. That's okay. Do you want to answer that question, or you prefer not to? Um, I don't to okay. All right. You do some thinking while Lockie answers. Okay. Um, I would love grown-ups to understand that there is some stuff that kids um that kids know and would um love and would love to share and not be overlooked. Boom. That's just a mic drop moment right there. I'll walk off the stage. Wait, I think I know. <laughs> All right, Henry, you say, and then we're going to come back to Lockie. He's got something else. To remember to pray to God. Yes. Well, if it's true for kids, it's good for grown-ups. That's really important, Henry. Great remembering. All right, Lockie, we're going to finish with you because when we talked about this, um, I s we sort of said, well, if you're saying that that's important, are there some ways that you think parents could, or teachers or grown-ups could not overlook kids? Is there some ideas that you've come up with that you think could be helpful? Um, I guess um, um, I'd, I'd love um, for people to know um, that we can do everything you guys can do um, and that we don't just want to wait around. Um, we want to see revival and we want to pray for people all shapes and sizes and, and ages. And we, we, we want to see um, families know, we, we don't want to just see families know Christ, we want to see countries know Christ. Preach the word. I love that. He wrote that himself. Mum didn't help him with that and I didn't help him with that. That's come out of his own dream and his own heart. And I think that's so important. Kids have huge God-sized dreams that helps them to tap into God's heart. And so thank you for having the courage to share that, Lockie. That's really brave. And I think it's true. And I think God's going to use each one of you really powerfully because you already are growing in wisdom. You already are growing in knowing the difference between right and wrong, choosing the right and honouring God. So thank you so much. Can we put our hands together for them? Well done, young people. Yeah. High five me. No, they need a bigger round of applause than that. Come on. I've got two mics. Hang on. <laughs> Sam, can you take this one? 
How good was that? So good exercise to get kids to do, to write down what they think will be really good for adults to know because you'd be surprised at some of the things they come up with. And sometimes I think we're a bit nervous about some of the things they come up with because <laughs> it might reveal sometimes there's some things that we perhaps do that aren't helpful or could be more helpful. So thank you very much. The difference between foolish and wise people, I think the, all the children who shared touched on it, but... The Proverbs, book of Proverbs, really does stress that the difference between foolish and wise people is how someone receives instruction or correction. How someone receives instruction or correction. Let's take a look at this video from some other kids. I would say wisdom is important, so start practicing and keep practicing now. That's really cool. The difference between foolish and wise people in the Proverbs, it's really clear, it is how someone receives instruction or correction. All throughout the Proverbs, wise people are willing to listen and learn. Foolish people will not listen and don't think they need to learn anything. In Proverbs 12, 15, it says, The way of foolish people seems right to them, but those who are wise listen to advice. And Henry and Lockie and Chloe talk to us about that. To leave foolishness behind and keep practicing or keep growing or start growing in wisdom, it means you need to be willing to let someone who is wiser tell you and instruct you how to live. And we don't like that. It comes back to that thing where we sin, we want to run our lives our own way. In Proverbs 9, verse 8 to 9, it says, Don't warn those who make fun of others or they will hate you. Warn those who are wise and they will love you. Teach a wise person and they will become even wiser. Teach a person who does right and they will learn even more. Wise people are willing to be taught and corrected. And this is not just for kids. This is for grown-ups too. Foolish people will not be taught by anyone and hate wise advice. Has anyone got a pair of reading glasses I can borrow? Sam, give me yours. <laughs> cool. When I was 18 or 19, I was driving around in my car trying to see the street signs. And I noticed bit after bit, especially at night time, that I was having to do this. And I thought, what is going on? And it kept happening and it was getting worse. And I was only 19 and I thought, this is ridiculous. How can it be that I'm having to squint to see things, to look at street signs? And finally, I had to own up to the fact that I probably needed to go to the optometrist. The optometrist is an eye doctor. And I probably needed to ask them, can I see okay or is my eyes not very good in looking at stuff. And I actually had to consider, oh, these are nice, at age 19, wearing glasses. And that was a humbling thing. Because I had to choose to go, I need help with this. I can't actually see on my own. And that's actually a bit like wisdom. If we want to see the difference between right and wrong and choose the right, we need to be willing to put on a new set of glasses. Actually be willing to sometimes look silly to other people, but be willing to learn, willing to see things from God's perspective. Thank you, Sam. Did I look good in them? Oh, thank you. When I had babies, my hormones changed my body and I don't need glasses anymore. How cool is that? Come on. <laughs> it doesn't always happen. It could have gone the other way, okay? It could have gone the other way. <laughs> But to leave foolishness behind and grow in means to wisdom means you have to put on a new pair of glasses and be willing to let someone who is wiser tell you and instruct you how to live. You have to admit that you need wisdom. You have to admit, I can't see on my own. I need someone who's going to help me see things right. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Proverbs 1, seven, it says, If you really want to gain knowledge, you must begin by having respect for the Lord. But foolish people hate wisdom and instruction. And I just want to talk about this word fear because 
so many times throughout the Bible, we hear God saying, do not fear. Do not fear. And so then in this verse, it says, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What does that actually mean? Well, it's actually a different kind of fear. It's not fearing fearing punishment. God doesn't want us to fear punishment. He doesn't want us to fear what might happen, danger, all those things. Because he has accepted us. He doesn't punish us and he is wanting to help us and keep us safe. But this type of fear is a different meaning. It actually means to respect God, to reverence him and who he is. And I want to show you a picture for me that helps me understand what this kind of fear is. Can we put that next picture up? This is a picture of Prince Harry. Prince Harry, who's a royal prince, and he's going for a walk. And he happens upon this teenage girl, and she is so overwhelmed and in awe that Prince Harry, the prince, would choose to stop, come near to her, and give her a hug. I reckon that's a little bit of what God's talking about it was when he says, to fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, to recognize that he is God and we are not, and that he's got something to say and cares about our life, and he wants to speak into it. It's an honor. It's a privilege. It's something not to be taken lightly. She'll remember that situation <laughs> for the rest of her life. And it's, that photo is going around the world. But it's like another picture that someone's given is if you were in a storm and you were hidden in a cave and you were safe in a cave, but you could see out the storm of everything that the storm could do, but you knew you were in this cave. That's what it's like to fear the Lord. It's to know that you're safe in his care, protected by him, but to be in awe of what he can do. Proverbs 9.10 says, If you want to become wise, you must begin by respecting the Lord. To know the Holy One is to gain understanding. And I want us to look at this quote from C.S. Lewis, who wrote about Aslan. Aslan the Lion. There's, a, there's a, a scene in the story where one of the children asks about whether Aslan's safe. And the other child responds, who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And so fearing the Lord is knowing that, that he is God and we are not. And he's got something to say about our lives, but that it's good. That he can do anything and everything, but he's got something to say and it's good. And so the Bible encourages us to keep, to start with that place of respect for God, but to keep coming back to Jesus. Because the wisdom of the world is not real wisdom. We have to start with Jesus because the Bible tells us he's both the wisdom of God and the power of God. And we are to keep coming back to Jesus. We can't control him and put him in a box. But he is good. And he wants good for our lives. He's proved it by laying down his life. We are to keep coming back to Jesus. Or start, maybe you've started today, saying, come into my life. Because he is Lord and we are not. We need to see the world and keep learning to see the world how he sees it, putting on those new set of glasses, growing in wisdom. He made us for himself. He is the master designer. He created us. He laid down his life for us. And we can trust him with our whole lives because he is good and he has showed us his huge love. And do you know that he has the right to be the boss of our lives? Because he paid to win us back to himself with his precious blood. It cost him so much. He didn't pay for us with money, with coins. He paid for us with his own life. And he will lead us with love. We can come under the leadership of 
him over our lives because he is the good shepherd who's laid down his life for the sheep. I just want to finish with this verse because if you have given your life to Jesus, you belong to him. You belong to him. In 1 Corinthians 1.30 it says, because of what God has done, you belong to to Christ Jesus. He has become God's wisdom for us. He makes us right with God. He makes us holy and sets us free. So start with Jesus. The fear of the Lord. Jesus is the Lord of Lords, is the beginning of wisdom. But keep coming back to Jesus. If you have given your life to him, if you've surrendered leadership of your life over to him, you are not the boss of your own life. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. And we live in a society that screams at us all the time about our rights, about our choices, about our way. But if we've chosen to follow Jesus, it's actually about his right, his claim to our life. His way, His desires. You cannot control Him or put Him in a box, but He's good. And He wants to have His way in your life. In Hebrews 11.6, it says, You can never please God without faith, without depending on Him. Anyone who wants to come to God must believe that there is a God. And that he rewards those who sincerely look for him. There is a God. When we come to him, we start with the fact that he is God and we are not. But we also come knowing that he hears, he cares, he wants to respond to us. Can we stand together and close our eyes? Kids and grown-ups, I want you to just think in your mind right now. What is it that you are going through right now? Is there someone at school who's giving you a hard time? Have you felt frustrated that other kids are allowed to do stuff that your parents say that your family doesn't do? Have you been trying to sort out a situation and manipulate and control everyone around you, grown-ups? And today God's word is... Be still and know that I am God. Is there something that you're wanting to assert your way and your rights? And God's saying to you, I want you to lay that down. I want you to seek me for my way and my will in your life. Is there something that he's asking you to change your mind about that's what repentance means it means to change your mind to turn your back on going your own way agreeing with God and going his way is there something he's saying that's happening in your life where he's saying I want you to change your mind about that because that's not wise it's not good for you it's not honoring to me it's not glorifying to me he's encouraging you to turn your back on it but turn towards him because he's right there with you not just turn your back on it and try and sort it out yourself but turn your back on it and walk towards him face him because he is and his love is better than life so much better than the loves that we give our heart over to
this morning, I, I just really feel that he's reordering, reordering some loves, saying, let those other things drop off. I'm your first love. You need me to teach you about life. You need me to show you the way ahead. You need me to speak. You need me to guide. You can't do this life on your own. But how good and how gracious he is. That when our hearts drift and he speaks to us and we, we offer them back to him, he never rejects us. He never pushes us away. But he just says, turn and face me. Give over this area of your life. Maybe give over your whole life <laughs> to him and say, have your way, Jesus. I don't want religion. I don't want to play church. I don't want to go through the motions. I want a real and vital living relationship with Jesus Christ. Whatever it is that he's speaking to you about, just do business with him now. Just bow down in your heart. Thank you, Lord. Admit you need him. Ask for his wisdom. Ask for his help. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you're here by the power of your Holy Spirit and you've been speaking through your word. You don't want all the stuff we can do for you. You want us. And so we give you our hearts and our lives. We don't hold ourselves back. We, we turn and face you <laughs> and say, have your way, Jesus. We start with you. We come back to you. We reaffirm that it's you that we need and rely on. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just start to thank him. Laura, do you want to come with the team? We might sing a song of worship. Just start to thank him. Thank him for his faithfulness. Thank you for his goodness. Thank him that he's never left you or forsaken you. That when we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to sing this magnificent song. It's an opportunity for us. It's really a prayer, a prayer of gratitude, a prayer of thanks, a prayer of dependence. Oh, Lord, my God. Oh, Lord, Jesus is Lord. Oh, Lord, my God. Let's sing this together with worshipful hearts to him. Thank you, Jesus.